Um, so I think we shouldn't exaggerate. But I think there is a narrative that Melanie, I must say, must, has been portraying over the years that, you know, this idea that the Muslims are taking over and Sharia law is, you know, creeping Sharia law. Uh, I mean, I just see them as potential Muslims. You know, that's like, uh, you know, I, I see a pub as a future mosque. That's what that's what I'm here to do. You know, not to keep this country, not to be a minority in this country, in a non-Muslim majority country. I want this country to become Muslim, obviously through a process of dawah and not through violence or anything like that. You know, this idea that the Muslims are taking over and Sharia law is, you know, creeping Sharia law. Uh, I mean, I just see them as potential Muslims. You know, that's like, uh, you know, I, I see a pub as a future mosque. I mean, uh, I think the question for 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 Britain would be, do you actually have the British values? That's the main thing. It doesn't matter if you're. <laughs> I don't feel British at all. Okay. Yeah, I never have done. I've always felt an alien in this country. Um, sorry if that shocks you, but I I just, I just don't feel British at all. I feel Muslim first and foremost. Always have done. Uh, even when I was young, I didn't feel British. But England, there's an issue in Eng with England yeah. uh, and the way Muslims are treated in England specifically. That's why I would never support England at football. That's why I love it when Argentina beat England on penalties. So I think we shouldn't exaggerate. Yeah. And a lot of um, British Muslims, if they think they can just live comfortable lives here, you know, for the rest of their lives, have a nice car, nice job, nice house, chill out on the weekends, whatever, they're in for a rude awakening because the price of that is you give up your Islam. You know, this idea that the Muslims are taking over and Sharia law is, you know, creeping Sharia law. And I think if, if I spoke about Jews the way that Melanie spoke, speaks about Muslims, then I would be um, hung, drawn and quartered for anti-Semitism. You've just proved my point. Any criticism of Islam is called Islam. You go much further than that. I have criticised yeah. aspects of Islam mm. and especially is Islamist extremism and Islamist totalitarian instincts and what I would call Islamofascism. For that, I am called Islamophobic. Mm. Yes. What I have said is based on evidence and truth. Mm. Is anti-Semitism is based on lies. That is the difference. There is no equation that should be reasonably made well, I think between we Islamophobia the equally. and um, anti-Semitism. I don't want to poke fun at Jews. No, truth I don't and want to poke lies fun at any cannot religion. be equated. And I just want Muslims to be treated the same as everyone else in this society. In contradiction to Sharia law, who institutionalized the subjugation, discrimination, and mistreatment of just about any social category other than Muslim males, in Britain, Islamists, like the one currently speaking, have exactly the same constitutional rights as any other citizen in the country. Yeah, we do have certain freedoms, but I don't think we should be comparing ourselves to Muslims in the Muslim world. We should be comparing themselves to non-Muslims in this country because we're citizens. We're not, we're, not, we're not guests in this country. We are citizens with the same rights as any white non-Muslim, black non-Muslim, whatever. That's who we should be comparing ourselves to. And compared to them, we are second-class citizens in this country. It's written into law because pre <laughs> prevent, you know, the counter ex uh, yeah, yeah. terrorism extremism strategy basically is a monitoring and spying operation on Muslims. And all our kids are in schools and they're being basically referred to counter terrorism police officers if they support Palestine or if they say something against LGBT. Now, we are being treated differently to any other community. That means we're second class citizens and that is in law. Prevent is a program set to counter violent extremism that mostly comes from Islamic oriented radicalization, is a response against Islamic terrorism and in no way a political tool. The UK, contrary to Sharia, doesn't discriminate over its citizens and don't try to control the minds of citizens with law. And that's not to mention the Islamophobia we suffer, you know, through the media, through politics, our countries being invaded, you know, our religion being attacked, uh, our prophet being attacked. Uh. The social negativity against Islam comes from Islamically driven terrorism and the regressive fascist ideas in Islam, not from Western character and social deficiencies. The irony is that the speaker unapologetically expressed some such ideas in this same interview. Islamists like the West to keep compromising their values so they won't compromise their own in the least little bit. You know, it's like um, it's open season on, on Muslims, quite frankly, and we're, we're not treated the same as other citizens of this country. How Islamists like Ro Roshan Salih conceive tolerance. He gets to unapologetically keep his abhorrent social views and preach them uninterrupted until Britain becomes an Islamic state and British people need to do allovotomy, not to be bothered by his regressive ideas and, and quietly 
sing Kumbaya, Kumbaya, my Lord, until they become dimnies. That is his perception of tolerance. So, his perception of tolerance is, I don't get to compromise in the slightest my views that bring Islamophobia, and the British people just need to learn to accept me as I am. <laughs> that is his idea of how tolerance works. He, he, get, he gets to keep and be as he is with all these abhorrent views of Sharia, and all the rest need to, to fix themselves according to his standards. No, this is not how it works. You, to, to understand the levels of your delusion, my friend, you say, Britain, I want Britain to become an Islamic state. The last time somebody tried to make Britain a dictatorship, you know what happened? British people burnt alive a whole city. Dresden, Dresden. Okay, burnt alive, literally. Okay, with firestorms. We, mothers were trying to hold their children from the storm of the fire, and it was so strong, the fires, that it was sucking in the children from the hands of mothers. That is what happened <laughs> the last time. Somebody tried, tried to make Britain an, a, a dictatorship. So, will this be so easy? Make Britain an Islamic state? Or you are just a deluded maniac and you don't know what you are talking about? Why are we here? There's a lot of, there's a lot of ulama that I've consulted who say that we can't even be in this country, a non-Muslim country that rules by kufr, unless we're giving dawah to the non-Muslims. So I'm, I'm kind of doing that. I've got an excuse, uh, you know, because Five Pillars is very public-facing, non-Muslims read it. What is the excuse of those Muslims in this country that are not giving dawah? And the only, you know, the only thing they're doing is getting bigger houses and bigger cars and, and more money and, you know, kind of, um, you know, indulging in the dunya. I don't know. Uh so listen to these people, okay? Listen to the double talk. It's, it's amazing to me. As Rory my, Rory, my friend, said, double talk. Yes, that's exactly right. So this, this uh, guy just said that the only reason Muslims should immigrate is not about getting a better life, economy, uh, you know, political reasons, and so this, all this kind of stuff, but they immigrate as stealth jihad with dawah to make the places to Im they immigrate Islamic State. This is what he says right now. Yet, in an interview he made, he also said this. Um, so I think we shouldn't exaggerate. But I think there is a narrative that Melanie, I must say, must, has been portraying over the years that, you know, this idea that the Muslims are taking over and Sharia law is, you know, creeping Sharia law. But she was wrong, eh? Guys, the only thing you need to do to, to refute a Muslim, you don't need to know anything. You don't need to know anything. Just wait. <laughs> wait a couple of... It might be days. It might be a month. It might even be a year, years. But the same Muslims who were saying something refute themselves after, <laughs> after some time. The Daily Mail wrote with horror this weekend that whilst ISIS were murdering innocent people in Paris, locally in Bedford, a panel of Muslims discussed their desire to one day see the establishment of an Islamic State. To quote their headline, Radical panellists at Quiz a Muslim event demanded establishment of an Islamic State in Britain as jihadists went on bloody rampage through Paris. Well, amongst the panellists that evening was Dilly Hussein, a Bedford Muslim who works for the Five Pillars website, a website which seeks to help people better understand Islam and its place here in the UK. And to see the return of such a polity is not a strange or fringe opinion amongst Muslims. Um, it is something that has been prophesied by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So it's not a strange concept. It's just a concept that's been tarnished for a society which is governed 
uh, by God's law is something that's more desirable than a secular liberal democracy. However, that doesn't say that they can't live in a secular liberal democracy because they are living in a secular liberal democracy. They are living as peaceful, tax-paying, law-abiding citizens. Well, my colleague Roberto also asked Dilly where this new Islamic State or caliphate would be if not here in the UK. Um, I, w- I wouldn't say. I mean, that's something like Pap Tajo or Hizbut Tahrir can answer. But when they say Muslim world, I'm guessing that's somewhere anywhere from Morocco to Indonesia, I guess. First, before we hear from Douglas, Roshan Mohamed Sali is editor of the Five Pillars website and he joins me now. Good morning to you. Good morning. Morning. So... Do you feel then that some British Muslims would rather live in an Islamic state under Islamic law rather than in our own British liberal secular democracy? Yeah, I think some might. Um, But it's difficult. You know, we're a three million strong, very diverse community, which includes Shias, Sunnis, Baralis, Urbandis, apolitical Muslims, political Muslims. So we can't generalise. I think some probably would, although I think they feel that there isn't a proper Islamic state anywhere in the world. But uh, the fact is that that most British Muslims are happy to stay put in this country and and most British Muslims are very appreciative of this this country and what it's offered them. But, for example, if I if if I move to if I moved to Argentina, for example, and wanted to live there, then I would have to just accept the way that things are in Argentina and I wouldn't want to try and change their their laws or their methods of dealing with, with their lives in Argentina. No one's trying to change British laws. Where do you get that idea from? But wouldn't you rather, ultimately, I mean, let me ask you this direct question, would you rather Britain was governed by Islamic law? Uh, No, I think it has to be done by consensus. I think that um, ultimately Muslims are a minority in this country. So it would be ridiculous for this country to be governed by Islamic law. Islamic law, wherever it happens in the world, if it happens, must be, um, can't be imposed by force. It must be only enacted through consensus of people living in that society. What would be the benefits? Just explain to those of us that don't know an awful lot about Islam, what, what would be the benefits of living under Islamic law? The attraction is that Muslims would be able to live according to their own values and wouldn't have to perhaps uh, compromise on their values, such as living in this country, for example. Uh, I'll give you a direct example. Uh, there's something called usury or interest in the banking system. That's something that is prohibited for Muslims. Uh, but it's a fact of everyday life in this country. If you want to buy a house, if you want to do, you know, get a credit card or whatever, you have to deal in usury. And things like that make Muslims feel very uncomfortable. But the thing is that uh, ISIS and the Taliban and others have, uh, you know, kind of tarnished the conception of an Islamic state. Non-Muslims especially have a very kind of, you know, kind of tabloid uh, view of what an Islamic state really is. And how would women be treated in an Islamic state. Well, um, you know, uh, women will be treated according to Islamic law, which accords them the rights according to Islamic law. Um, I mean, I, I think I'm not an Islamic scholar, so I can't give you chapter and verse on this, but I think that... So the ownership of five pillars, the owner, this guy, says, do you support the concept of women sports played in public? It is compatible with Islamic principles. So it was kind of a rhetorical question because the editor of Five Pillars the next day tweeted this. No Muslim should support the concept of women's sport played in public. Pretty obvious that it contravenes Islamic principles. Let them play their games behind closed doors but not in public. And amazingly, this editor of Five Pillars has an unhealthy obsession against the women's football team of Britain. Hear these people. Lionesses, we want to send you a huge good luck for tomorrow. We're sorry we can't be there in person, but we're so proud of everything you've achieved and the millions you've inspired here and around the world. So go out there tomorrow and really enjoy yourselves. Good luck, Lionesses. Translation, I'd rather tidy my sock drawer than watch 22 women trip over themselves while attempting to play a man's game. Rock, paper and scissors, final streaming live this Sunday. The Loosernesses. This is not hijab. So Muslims stop jumping up and down about representation. 
Hijab is about covering the body and the shape, not just sticking a garment on your head. And I know the Women's Rights Brigade, including westernized Muslims, are going to crucify me for this tweet, but I don't care. This is not hijab. Obviously, an Islamic conception of gender relations is different to a Western conception of gender relations. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not, I mean, when Prophet Muhammad came along, women were treated like chattel. They were buried as infants. Uh, and uh, when Islam came along, they, uh, you know, the rights were given to women like never before in history. They could own their own property. Uh, you know, they could, they could work. They weren't simply the property of men. You know what? I don't believe in women's education. She kind of looked shocked back at me, stunned like I was from a different planet. Many of you watching this are probably just as confused as my wife was that night. But after I explained to her exactly why I don't believe in women's education and my Islamic reasons for this, she came to fully agree with me. I hope the same will be the case with everyone listening today. My position in this debate is simple. Pursuing education empowers women, but Islam is against empowering women. I know this sounds shocking to some, but hear me out. What I mean by empowerment is increasing social status and power through education or career. A man who needs no introduction, um, Daniel Hakikuchu is a person who synthesizes Islamic knowledge. Uh, but that said, I think there is a lot of sexism um, and there is a lot of sexism in the Muslim world and, and we have a, a lot of, uh, you know, kind of ground to make up there and we can perhaps learn from Western countries. Uh, what about, what about gay to, people? Uh, how, how would gay people be treated in this uh, ideal uh, Islamic homo world? Uh, homosexuality is considered a sin in Islam, so uh, I think in an Islamic state homosexuality would be illegal. I think there's no doubt about that. But at the same time, uh, the Islam that I know does not persecute minorities, doesn't encourage violence against minor minorities. And, and do Homosexuality will be legal, but the Islam he knows won't prosecute minorities. So, homosexuals are a minority. You will deem them illegal and prosecute them. But the Islam you know doesn't prosecute minorities. Guys, five pillars. I dare say these people, because nobody, for so long, nobody responded to them. They, they reach levels over regular Muslim apologies in stupidity and hypocrisy. <laughs> if, if that is even possible. And yes, it is possible. <laughs> Sally, what's your name? Dude, you cannot say a sentence. So the first part of your sentence argues with the second part of your sentence. I said years, days. You cannot say a sentence without the second part of your sentence contradicting the first part of your sentence. Are you kidding us? You want news... <laughs> You report the news. <laughs> These guys report the news. Mm. Thank you very much.